Have you ever wondered or pondered why some individuals, even in their modest income, seems to accumulate wealth and enjoy financial serenity in the later stages of their life? Conversely, why do some high earners, despite having impressive paychecks, find themselves in the treacherous web of debt, perpetually chasing the lifestyle and seemingly estranged from their true purpose and passion? And I think every one of us have seen uh, people around us, even if we haven't uh, discovered ourselves, that what is our true passion and why certain decisions like financial decisions are so important in our life. Now, we can also think like, how about the monetary success always doesn't equate to financial wisdom or security? Or what does it truly mean to not only earn, but the master the art of preserving and growing wealth, and at the same time, alignment with their deeper calling. While uh, you have already found, or I would say figured out that we are going to discuss about finance and wealth management today. So first of all, uh, welcome to Let's Talk Podcast, all the guests and listeners uh, on different platforms. So first of all, I would like to again encourage, if you're liking our content, please uh, provide feedback and consider subscribing. That will help us to get more quality guests like we always do. So our next guest, uh, if I tell something about him, he has already walked into the these intricate maze of finance, not just as an observer, but since uh, he was a child, uh, I think at the age of 10, he started his foray in, into investing. And by his late teens, he was amidst with the giant, uh, I would say, the finance names like uh, the UBS. Yet, he, I think one of the transformation, what he really got is uh, in Lucia Capital Group, where he morphed uh, the whole financing architecture from his uh, passion and vision into a hundred million enterprise. So the name here is Chris Christopher. And again, uh, Chris, please uh, don't mind me. I just forgot uh, how do you pronounce your last name. And once you get on to the stream, please uh, uh, enlighten us to your last name as well. But as we uh, discuss with Chris, we will de decipher something about what he learned about um, wealth, finance, and why. Because he's also one of, uh, one of the finest and certified uh, finance manager uh, who helps uh, individuals and organizations to think about finance and wealth in a very curious way as well, and beyond the confinements on balance sheets. So uh, as we navigate to the corridors of ben, uh, finance and wealth, so let's welcome uh, the trailblazer who dedicate himself to unlocking these mysteries of finance and wealth. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yes. And it is Christopher A. Pana Yotu. And my initials Pana are Yotu. CAP. And that's where the cap and capitalize stems from. Now, I got to tell you, SG, that was one of, if not the best, dare I say, award winning introductions of all time. I don't really even think I. Oh, you've been too kind. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point, I could just wrap it up and, and just say go from there. Um, but I'm excited to be here. I know we've been playing. Uh, calendar tag back and forth from circumstances that we obviously could not control. Um, but sometimes the best things on earth are worth the wait. And I believe that this is one of those things. So I'm excited to enlighten your listeners on whatever we want to talk about, whether it's finance, whether it's fitness, whether it's life, whether it's business. And, uh, you know, my, my compliance people uh, don't, uh, don't thoroughly appreciate this, but we're going to make it as entertaining as possible. So it's going to be fun. Yeah, looking forward to it. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, uh, when we talk about finance and wealth, and if you would like to give some perspective about your mindset, like as I read that from the age 10, you yes. started investing. Mm -hmm. uh, how exactly that unfolds? If you just give a, a very brief uh, synopsis of your summary of your life, why we are having this conversation and what exactly your background looks like. So 
at 10, okay, let, let me, let me start it this way. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a financially literate household. Did I grow up in the household that knew what I know today? No, no. They may, you know, they may have thought it, but mm -hmm. no. Um, you know, my, my mom grew up in a household, um, in a wonderful family, you know, her mom and dad were married for 72 years, which is unreal. Um, you know, my grandpa was a chemical engineer. My grandma was in, in administration, wanted to be a nurse, but back then it just, it wasn't in the cards. And, mm -hmm. and so, and then my mom's brother, I guess my uncle ran his own, his own business. And then I, I don't have any relation with, with my father, or his side of the family anymore, but my father was in obsessed Warren Buffett it almost like a cultish following. Mm -hmm. And, um, the reason why I bring that up is, you know, from an investing standpoint, you combine all of that. I was around terminology of investing in business, but I was never directly taught anything. I had to learn it all on my own. And there's a, <laughs> that, that's one where we just go and get a drink after this. And I tell you about the family because it, it's, it's wild. But I remember right before my 10th birthday, um, Starbucks, right? Pacific Northwest. That's where it was just booming. Everyone and their mother literally was <laughs> drinking Starbucks. And I've always loved the smell of coffee. I've always loved the taste. I've always found it fascinating. So I remember my mom got some Starbucks and as a child, you're not supposed to drink coffee. Right. So she <laughs> said, basically don't touch this. And of course she goes around the corner and I, I take a sip and I fell in love with it. And after I was, you know, verbally crucified for not doing, uh, what my mom told me not to do. Right. And I didn't listen. I was immediately hooked to coffee. And that's when my, my parents said that you could actually own a piece of that business. Now, you know, back then I didn't know what that meant. I thought, okay, this is my phone, but like, let's pretend this was a cup of coffee. I thought, oh, I, I own the company because I have this cup of coffee. That was my understanding. And for my 10th birthday, I was gifted the intelligent investor by Ben Graham. Now, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, you just read this cover to cover and you were savant. No, not even remotely close. The saving grace was the year that I, I got that, that gift. So Benjamin Graham, again, Warren Buffett's business, uh, not business partner, Warren Buffett's teacher taught him everything he knew about investing. That book was written originally in the, I think the thirties and forties. And it's kind of known as the, the, the godfather. He's known as the godfather of investing. That's known yeah. as like the Bible of investing. Now, coincidentally, Jason Zwieg, who's an amazing financial journalist, took that version and then made a translated version into modern day. So if chapter one was about ABC one, two, three, he would basically say, okay, ABC one, two, three, but instead of talking about B and O railroad, which I, you know, unless you play Monopoly, you don't have a clue yeah. what's going on. He would say something like, okay, well, this is how I would approach it today with Starbucks or Microsoft, which are the first two stocks I bought. And that's how I got started in the world of investing. And so my grandparents set aside money for college, a uh, couple hundred bucks. And I was granted that access to trading it. And in 2001, that was right before 9 11, because my birthday is May 31st. And I say that because my portfolio went from, you know, $400 to $150. And my life, I thought, was over. And then something told me inside, you got to go and just reread the book. And that's when I learned very quickly oh, there's a lot of emotional unintelligence going on right now. I didn't have the vocabulary that I do now, but like just intuitively. And so then I realized, oh, I don't need to sell anything. Like actually nothing has changed other than the emotion of most people. So I'm actually really blessed. I started at a really awful time in the world of investing because that's what started the compounding of my lack of emotion when it comes to doing what I'm doing, because then you approach it just practically. So basically you already seen the low when, when you started. It was already low and then everything beyond that was rising. Yeah. Or, or, or reframing it. I wouldn't even mm -hmm. call it like the low. 
I would say I quickly was opened to the idea that there's a difference between the price of a company and the value of a company. And I'm very fortunate. Like no one really learns. I don't want to go too far on a tangent because mm-hmm. I know you have a tremendous amount of questions. But, you know, I tell people, I, whether it's clients or fans or, or even family and friends, no one really learns anything when a stock just crushes it. Other than, well, I was right. And here you go. And you do learn things, but you don't really. You learn the most when there's absolute chaos and there's metaphoric blood in the streets. And then you go, oh, those are things that I maybe shouldn't have done. And then you add that to your checklist. And then over time, you build this fortress of a checklist. I think mine is up to 182 questions right now. Mm -hmm. And I go through it with every single type of long-term investment. Short-term, it's a little bit different and I'm not going to you know, bore you with the details on that. But for long-term investments, if, if I get to question 160 and it's a no, mm-hmm. I'm out. I'm out. And and it and it keeps my emotions in check. It keeps the, the bowling lane bumpers up for me. And so I know that I'm basically just compounding this fortress of questions yeah. that um, will allow me to hopefully not be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I totally understand. Before we go ahead in our conversation, my daughter just came up here. So let me just, <laughs> okay. let me just put her back here. Just give me a moment. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. And while you're doing that, uh, we will take a quick pause. And uh, selfishly, the sponsor of today's episode is my own book on Amazon.com. I know we're going to be talking about that later, but if you are trying your damnness to truly capitalize on your finances, head on over to Amazon.com, type in capitalize your finances, you will get my award-winning book. And if you would like to leave a five-star review, that would be fantastic. No pressure, but my daughter's college fund depends on it. Now, SG is back from his daughter's endeavors, and we will continue with the discussion. Perfect. That that's a great way to uh, remove any dead air here. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, so just to kind of uh, quickly, uh, if I can, if I may paraphrase. So uh, obviously, at the tender age, you you got some exposure about investing and yes, a way a way of looking at things rather than as a consumer. Uh, I think you also been told that you can be an owner, a co-owner by mm-hmm. uh, investing and getting some stocks and and that also triggers some of your thoughts around what investing looks like and you started into the foray and this is i think very key uh, and pivotal moment while people are listening or viewing this uh, podcast it's first of all very important uh, to educate yourself there are a lot of people who are getting uh, investment and wealth management or financial advisory late in their mm-hmm. uh, in their uh, life, but you have to start somewhere. So why not start today? And if you have kids, try to evaluate when is the right time you can start working on it. Uh, mm-hmm. w- talk to them about, like, for example, one of uh, the guests mentioned, uh, and I, I'm trying, where they said that uh, when you reward your kids for doing something right, maybe in a monetary way, Mm-hmm. then you also have to, at some point, start taking some part of it. Like if you're giving $1, take 20 cents out. Mm-hmm. And when they say why, this is basically called tax. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. So in that way, it helps them to understand that how exactly world works. And it's not mo- your mommy and daddy will not be around forever to give you what you want. And mm-hmm. if you ask $1, you will be getting $1. No, you might get 80 cents. Or yeah. if you are talking the stocks, you might ask for one dollar and you get end up getting one dollar twenty five cents. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Well, I'll tell you right now that that's actually one of the things that I talk about extensively with people because they go, "What? When is the earliest time? Like, what would you say is like too early?" Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, like we have an uh, almost nine month old at home. 
Abby is not going to understand what the heck I'm saying, right? Yeah. She's going to stare at me and spit up and poop. That's that's it, right? And then giggle about it. But I would say, you know, as soon as they can mumble out a couple words and just be, I mean, we're talking remotely understanding of what's going on in mommy and daddy's world. Start enlightening them. The tax thing is is the best, right? That that will two things are going to happen. One, tantrums will fly. And then two, basically every child that goes through that by definition will become a capitalist by the time they're older. Because <laughs> like yes. it is the most defeating thing in the world. If you're not used to it, like think about it. We didn't have that type of, well, I'm speaking for myself, but I don't think we had that type of upbringing. And so yes. you Same get as- to a point where, you know, you get your first paycheck and you're like, who the hell is FICA? That son of a bitch. Right. Like you're like, why, why does he or she deserve that money? It's like, no, no, no. That's your, that's, that's, that's social security. That's Medicare tax. And they're like, well, why do they need that? You know? And they're, they're all valid, valid questions. Um, but if you can get ahead of that and go, Oh, okay. I understand what I need to do. One of the things I talk about in my show a lot, and this is always a trick question, maybe not now, cause I'm literally mm-hmm. telling your listeners, but what is the best investment that you can guarantee? And the best investment you can guarantee other than yourself, which again is a super cheesy thing, but Mm -hmm. like qualifiably and quantifiably, I can prove that that's true. The best investment you can guarantee, it's not an investment. It is the taxes you avoid, period, no questions asked. And so if you understand a lot of that, forget the stocks or the real estate or private equity or any of these long-term investments. If you get the easy wins done, you're already ahead of 99% of people. And frankly, like even take your 401k or an IRA, if you've got one and you put the money in 6,500 bucks or 22,500, if you're under 50. So if that's the case, forget the fact that you're going to invest it for the long run. I mean, you've obviously got to do that, but it's the long run. So today, the biggest thing is you put that money in and you're saving You're earning the return on the tax bracket on the money that you're not paying in. So if you're in the 24% bracket and you put in $22,500, and let's just call it 25, you basically just made $6,500 on taxes you're not going to have to pay. That is a phenomenal rate of return. Now, someday you're going to have to, but you know, I tell people, get all of the easy wins out of the way first. And that's something that's not talked about in financial planning. And by the time you get all of those easy wins out, then you can, quote unquote, risk whatever you have left over in the long run. And as Monish Pabrai, one of my favorite hedge fund managers out there, shout out Monish, if you're listening, no pressure, you need to come on the show. One of his best quotes is, um, and I do not have his, his uh, you know, Indian accent, but I tried very hard because it's just great. He goes, <clears throat> I take no risk. So I can take all of the risk. And it's so profound because if you quantifiably set yourself up where you've got money for today, you've got your emergency fund, you've got the tax strategy that you're you're layering and you're doing all those things. By that point, anything left over, because you don't need money for today, you can capitalize on tomorrow. And with that, you're really not taking any risk because you're doing everything prudently and you have a long enough time horizon, unless you just invest like an astute moron, you're going to do more than fine. And that's just a different mindset that people, uh, unfortunately they don't have. And that's, that's kind of my calling and purpose is to enlighten people on that correct mindset. Yeah. So I think uh, you brought a very good point. So let's try to unwrap a bit thing. So as you mentioned that, tax avoidance. Uh, and, and I mean, that only happens, obviously, when you try to understand how the money works and how taxation and the, or the whole operations uh, work yeah. under under uh, need on that. And so when we say tax avoidance, obviously, some people may mistakenly think that you are not willing to give taxes for the betterment of the society, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you answer that? And then maybe subsequently you can mention that what are some of the strategies apart what you mentioned as 401k can be uh, to reduce. I mean, obviously we cannot 
avoid completely, but we can reduce mm-hmm. taxes by having a pretty uh, educated uh, things uh, to perform over there. So yeah, if you would like to kind of uh, give some perspective on that. Yeah. So there's there's really two questions in there. So the last <laughs> yes. one is more of like, I'd, I'd call like a, a planning question being yeah. technical, but the first one is more societal. Yeah. So like people have said, the devil's advocate, they'll go, well, <clears throat> Chris, you're basically recommending that you not only avoid these taxes, right? And that goes to, you know, the governmental agencies and and you're able to better society, blah, blah, blah. Here's my answer. Where does that money go? Mm-hmm. No one can really answer it. I don't know where it's going. I don't know if it's, I mean, yes, there are certain things, Medicare and social security, but you know, if you are going to be successful, then by definition, you're not going to get that money back that you're given to the tax man. It ain't happening. And so there's that. But then also secondarily, um, you're now saying that the government can compound your money better than you. That is a sad state of affairs, man. I mean, look what's going on right now. They have to print more money because they're spending it out their ass. So by definition, they're not the best capital allocators in the world. You know, I Warren Buffett, actually, there's a really in, intriguing story. And, and even though I am a fan of Warren Buffett, I'm not obsessed with the guy. I'm obsessed with learning the successes in the area of which he's been successful. But if you go and read his biography by Roger Lolstein, which is a phenomenal book as a quick tangent side note, mm-hmm. um, I wouldn't trade my life for his. Okay. That's a fun little teaser, but you know, one of the things that he mentioned in, and I think it was the sixties or seventies because he's, you know, about a million years old is one of his sons came to him because the media was saying, wow, he's not giving back enough and blah, 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 which, you know, for me, it's like, piss off. It's your money. I can figure out what to do with it. You can figure out what to do with it for you and your family. Um, but people talk because a lot of people have nothing else going on. And his son said, dad, like that, that does kind of intrigue me and bother me. Like, why aren't you giving back you know, more? And Warren comes to him and, and says, gosh, I, I, I know how you feel. And let me explain why. And Warren Buffett basically was saying was, I want to give back to society, but I'm going to be around for a long time. And that turned out to be very correct. And so he knew that if he wanted to give back in the best way, he needed to pursue the continuing lifelong pursuit of compounding wealth above and beyond what the government is going to be able to do. And so by the time he gets to that point and it's compounded where it has, and you can't deny it now, then he can go and give to his charities after he's gone. And he's given a little bit more later on in his life, but, but those those years at the beginning are mission critical for compounding your worth. And so when people tell me, wow, you don't want to give back to society, blah, blah, it's like, no, 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 I do. But I know that I'm doing myself, like my family and these entities a disservice. Because if I can continuously compound and compound and compound, and in some cases defer in perpetuity, you know, capital gains tax, if I go and and, and sell a stock someday, well, guess what? That's when you're going to get your bacon. Mm -hmm. Or even further, what if I have some charities or a charity that I, and and, and not just me, me and my wife, because we're a team on this, want to give to? Well, I would much rather give that compounded wealth and success to a charity or charities that are very prudent with their money and they run their, their charities like a business and they're not dumb with the money. And not only do I give it to those charities that are giving uh, back to really great societal causes that are important to us, you're also avoiding (laughs) the taxes in the process because you get a deduction. In some cases, you avoid it altogether. And so, you know, when I say that to people that, you know, have that argument of, well, you're not giving back to society, they kind of look at me like, oh, shit, well, how am I going to argue that? Yeah. So basically, yeah, I mean, it's very easy to give taxes and let the, uh, government decide what to do about it. And uh, I think what in the crux you are saying that let me have a control. I'll give back to the society much efficient way. 
yeah. than the government. Obviously, government has some role to take some fundamental yes. responsibility for the society. But that being said, uh, I can uh, definitely, from my effort, I have more control. And mm -hmm. I can compound that money and give it to those weaker sections of society where I deem right and I resonate with them. And uh, so it's my way of giving rather than forcing a certain way of giving. Yes. Uh, is that what you kind of reference? It is. To? Yeah. And, you know, I'm, <laughs> this is probably some of your listeners going to be like, wow, this is a controversial thought. Mm -hmm. But it's also just like policy. So, yeah. I mean, it's like specifically in the United States, we are one of, if not arguably the most progressive tax system in the world. And it's intriguing to me because, and this is never going to happen, but what if the brackets were flipped, right? So as you make more, right, that's scalable, you're not paying as much in tax. Obviously, you've got probably the same people that would argue, right? Oh my gosh, you're not giving back society, blah, blah, blah. Like they just go off the rails. But mm -hmm. if you think about it, practically, imagine how much more success there would be in this country because everyone and their mothers would be fighting tooth and nail to act actively better themselves because the higher up you're making, right? The more you're rewarded for it. And it's kind of an interesting thing because, you know, and not all business owners are, 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 you know, just ruthlessly terrible. In fact, the majority of them are, are phenomenal. Some of them, you know, they just stuff money in for themselves and that's, that's really too bad. I would tell you out of, out of our clientele, yeah, I'm going to say this a hundred percent of the business owners that we work with, you know, if there's ever like a difference on a, on a tax strategy or, or, you know, a, a corporate rate decrease or individual rate decrease, you know what they do? They take that and they funnel that difference to their employees as a reward. Mm -hmm. And it's because, hey, in many cases, I don't need now they might, you know, give themselves a little bonus because you got to it's like life is like an airplane. You put your oxygen mask on before you put others. Mm -hmm. But after that, most people that have had the ability to grow and compound their success they would rather choose to give back to the people that have gotten them to where they are. Like there's no one ever, there, there's no one I've ever met that can, that can say with confidence that they're independently wealthy. That is such a stupid term because, you know, I, I guess there probably are people out there where they've never hired anyone or whatever the case is. But even if that's the case, you have business partners, you have family, Right. You, you, it's such a narcissistic, egotistical, assholic way of thinking, which is the adjective for asshole. And so, you know, because of that, it's interesting because then a lot of these owners, as taxes are increasing and all that fun stuff, they don't have that ability to go and give bonuses. They don't have that ability to increase pay for a lot of people. And so it, it's, it's, it's pretty sad in that regard. Um, and I don't want to go too far down that, that rabbit hole, but it's the whole idea of it comes down to you having more confidence in controlling your financial future than an other entity out there. That That's a great point. So my question would be, uh, because most of the listeners are employed people. Yes. I mean, in my statistics, uh, uh, in my podcast, a lot of uh, more than 80% of the people are working for some firm. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned that, take control of your finances. Uh, for a person who's still trying to grapple the fact uh, in terms of financial education, what are the top three things you can say to get started? Okay, these three things you should start doing, uh, irrespective of whatever, whichever situation you are high earner, you are low earner, you are having uh, most of the people... 90, I mean, I mean, you must be knowing, but I think 90, 95% people are carrying certain kind of debt yes. in a different form. Again, there's a different discussion that how you can take debt and try to take it in your advantage. But coming in, in a very conventional way, people do have mortgages, car, uh, and a lot of other student debt and so on and so yep. forth. So what yep. are those top three things you can uh, start telling that these are the three things you should be doing to consolidate and try to start working on your finances. 
So for the purpose of time and for the purpose of yes. our interaction right now, I'm going to say this would be the one, two, three in order. Not necessarily always in this order, but just for now. Number one, whether it's debt or investing in the long run, you should benchmark a long-term rate of return of net of tax at least 6%. That is not an original idea by me. That is Charlie mm -hmm. Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, who is, I mean, he could be dead by, by now. I mean, he's supposed to be 100 on January 1, which is mm -hmm. wild. Side note, when he dies, I do expect flowers. That is going to break my heart. I love that mm -hmm. guy. So his thing is, I've always tried to earn net of tax 6%. Because by definition, you cannot help but become very wealthy off that. And then his joke is, which is such a white collar joke, I just overshot that, right? Because mm -hmm. he did. He did very well. So understand that you need to earn long run of 6%. And really 1A of that is understanding the value of debts. You know, you got on one side of it, right? Like the Dave Ramsey's where all debt is bad. Yeah. Stupid statement. And then you've got like Rob Kiyosaki, who's just like, go into debt. You get all these deductions, blah, blah. Also equally dumb. The, the middle ground of understanding the 6%, that number, that single fact is going to solve a tremendous amount of financial world problems for people. So uh, I would like to interrupt uh, on this, uh, the six person part of it. So if if a, a regular person listening to this and they say, okay, six person, then how do I kind of convert it to my daily expenses side of the house? I mean, are you talking or referring towards maybe some investment from the stock side or real estate or any other asset or I would like to look into that, what kind of my expenses are and try to save six person if you would like to elaborate for them. Right. Okay. So, so what I mean by the 6% is whether it's investing in the long run, you want mm -hmm. to earn at least that. And, or if you have debts of various interest rates, if those debts are above 6%, okay. right, you're going to want to hammer a lot of those out. And so, you know, what I would say regarding the expense, and this is actually number two. Okay. okay. Once you understand the, the value of 6%, number two is go into your expenses, know how much you're making every month net and go, what am I making minus what are my expenses? And that is what we call in the book and in, in, in my framework gap money. It's mm -hmm. a fancy way of saying profit. Profit just sounds douchier if you're talking to people business, it's very valuable. Okay. Yeah. So once you understand that, if it's positive, which for most people, it actually is, okay? Um, sometimes it's very slim, but hey, positive is positive. Once you understand that gap money, whatever you're making every month, right? Whether it's $500 or you know $1,000 a month, whatever the case is. What I tell people is give yourself some cushion, right? Like maybe if, if it's 1,000 a month, I'm, I'm using easy math. Maybe give yourself $200 a month to splurge, have some fun, and then be extremely prudent with that $800. So 6%, know your gap money. And then number three, and this is kind of a two-parter, you need to make sure you have your emergency fund set aside. For your younger listeners, they think they're invincible. They're not. Take it from me. A couple of weeks ago, like I was telling you, I was in the ER and, and you know, it was not ideal. And I'm not old, right? I'm 32. I'm still a, a, a baby in the world of, of business. But that was a wake up call for me saying, oh my gosh, thank goodness I had that cushion. Because then when you have that cushion, instead of now compounding the negativity in a plan, you can go, oh, like it's, it's almost like brushing your teeth. It's a chore, right? It's not fun. It's not not fun. You just strike the check from your emergency fund. You build it back up and you go from there. So from an emergency fund standpoint, younger listeners, generally speaking, you're going to be healthier than someone that's knocking on death's door. And so if that's the case, between three to six months of your emergency fund, I would tend to say you probably only need the three month side of things. And once you have that set aside, is that the best investment strategy? No, I would go with an online savings account because you're earning a higher interest rate. But 
it sets a foundation knowing that, okay, if I have to tap into something, I'm not going backwards. And then once you have that, again, like Mona said, take no risks. You can take all the risk. Then you go back to really number one and understanding 6%. So for example, your listeners, let's say they have student loans or personal loans or car loans and credit card debt. And then on the flip side, they have a retirement plan from their employee and they're getting a, a dollar for dollar match up to 4% or 50 cents on the dollar up to whatever. The first thing you've got to do is put in at least that match, right? So if it's dollar, dollar up to 4%, I don't really care what the match is, put in that percentage amount. Now that'll lower your gap money every month. But then after that, you go, okay, I've got this extra money. Now what do I do? And then it just depends on where you're at. So for most people, if you're in a lower tax bracket and you've got all of these debts, credit card debt, 25%, newsflash, anyone that says that they can earn you 25% is an asshole and you need to cut them out of your life. And so you need to now take all of your gap money and hammer that thing out. Mm -hmm. And then let's say you've got student loans that are in, in the higher percentages, maybe 10 or nine or even 8%. So then what you would do for that example, hammer out the 25, then take all of that free gap money, go to the 10, snowball it into the nine, snowball it into the eight. But then once you get to a point where you've got 6% or below, 6% you can kind of flip a coin if you, if you want to, but I would probably go 6% or low, pay what you need to, but don't overpay on it because I know in the long run, more likely than not, you are going to earn more than that 6% within your retirement. So then you take that gap money and you shift it over to your retirement plan. Now, if you don't have one, uh, that's where you would want to open like an individual retirement account or a Roth IRA mm -hmm. All right. um, or, or even go through the Roth 401k if you have that option. Mm -hmm. Because if you're in a lower tax bracket, pay the low taxes today. And then when it grows, it's, it's tax free. But that strategy, those three strategies that I just told you about, that is going to, those three tips by definition, unless someone just doesn't want to listen to me, will make you a millionaire. And in some cases, a multimillionaire. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good, actually, a uh, few things which everyone has to consider and just try to kind of uh, summarize what you mentioned is six percent is the magical number. You can yep. start working on it and see that if you're getting 6% return. Uh, obviously, how to find 6%, uh, we assume that you have some mathematical skills. If you do not have, we have online calculators, but uh, just start working on that part. And as you mentioned, that start pointing and working towards your uh, the debt, which is, I mean, converting to a pretty high interest rate uh, benefit maybe to corporations or banks, but it's not so good for you. So no. try to kind of, uh, paid them down. They are multiple strategies. We are not getting into that. Like, how do you have to work through all this? But as as a very uh, uh, person who do not want to get into that, or they have a certain constraint, try to work on the six person number, closer dread. And as you mentioned, that try to also be intentional about what are your income, what are your expenses, what is your cash flow, uh, the uh, get money you mentioned. And uh, I think. Uh, so one, one of the things out of all these things, a uh, uh, lot of people also discuss about, oh, I have to get into this. Then we have to think about frugality. Mm -hmm. What's your thought process? Uh, why people think, and there's a different spectrum. People say that, oh, yeah, frugality is the answer for everything. And some people say, oh, if I become frugal, I'm not enjoying my life. Hmm. What do you what do you say for these kind of conversations? I okay. <laughs> there's a, there's a couple of things. It's a great question. Number one, being frugal is not a bad thing, okay? But it has a negative connotation to it. And you know, like shoot, I'm frugal, hmm. but I don't really think of it as frugal. I just don't spend on unnecessary things. Now I'm a little weird. Cause like my guilty pleasure is my health and fitness and then also investing. So my guilty pleasure is also my passion, which that's a good one to have, but you know, I, I get, I'm a little unique there. I've told people remove frugality and replace it with, you're just extremely prudent with your money. 
And there's a mind shift there because prudency, it's not emotional. It's very factual. It's very just, you know, black and white. And one of the worst issues people have with money is the emotion, whether it's emotional intelligence or in most cases, unintelligence with money. Mm -hmm. And so by just flipping that mental switch of saying, okay, I'm really frugal to no, 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 no. I'm really prudent. Like, even as I'm saying it, you kind of light up a little bit. Yeah, And you're like, whoa, I'm just really responsible with my money. And then people get guilty. They, they feel guilty because they go, well, but now I feel like, you know, maybe my ego's growing and, and uh, you know, others aren't as prudent as I am. For me, I say, screw that. That's their problem. That's <laughs> not your problem. Be proud of your prudency. And, you know, I think the, the, the question of, well, I'm not living my life. That is an easy excuse to say, I'm not enjoying my life. Therefore, I need to live a little. Therefore, now I need to start giving myself the ability to have guilt-free bad habits, which is like super ironic. This is how I look at it. There's two, two sayings. Short-term pain is a long-term gain and a long-term gain is a or long-term pain is a short-term gain. There are many people out there that live in the moment and have that fun. And, you know, they just, they just want to live it up because, you know, when you're old, you're not going to be able to spend, or you're, you're not gonna be able to do all these fun things. Okay. Well, people are living longer. So strike one, strike two. It's not like you're going to be just old and decrepit in like five years. You've got you like light years until that point. So a lot of people are living to a hundred and can live to a hundred today. So you're telling me that, wow, I'm just going to live it up in my twenties but then I'm going to start compounding in my late thirties. Or in some cases, the average person starts thinking about retirement at 45. And I'm not saying it can't be done, but good gosh, like that is, that's a lot of compounding that you need to make up for. And that can get really scary. And I've met so many people that have come into my office that are in their fifties, sixties, or seventies. And they, they even start by, yeah, you know, I lived it up in the 70s and 80s. And I'm like, yeah, no shit, because you've got $30,000 set aside for retirement and you've got $40,000 in credit card debt. And now you're asking me at 55, well, when can I retire? Never, never is the answer. Now, I'm much more soft in those moments because there's a lot of emotion and all that, but it's fact of the matter. And so what I tell people is, being frugal is a great thing, but replace it with prudency. And when people go, man, I'm not living my life and blah, blah, blah. Guess what? This is what's going to happen. In five years, your friends that are living it up and you're being prudent and frugal, you don't have to work as hard because your money is working hard for you and your friends don't have that. So they have to constantly grind and grind and grind. And then in 10 years, maybe your investments have replaced 25% of your income, 50% of your income. I mean, if you get really lucky, then you're, you're done. But like most people aren't. And then your friends keep grinding and grinding and grinding. And then after 15 years, you could go, wait a second. I could take my foot off the gas. And by the time I'm normal retirement age, I'm going to be good. Like as of now. So, huh. I'm now 35, assuming you started this at 20. I've got another 65 years to do basically whatever I want versus those other people that have taken 10 years or 15 years and just party, party, party. And then now they're getting serious. They have to not screw this up for 65 years. How awful is that? So, you know, that's why I say replace frugal with prudency. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent uh, uh, thought process. Uh, as you mentioned that, yeah, you have to replace frugal with prudency and, and try to be intentional and think that while you can live the moment right now, how would you like your future to be? Uh, do you would uh, would you like an extravagant life? Nothing wrong with that, but do you also mix a fulfilling life? Do you want to? I mean, everyone is not born to work for others or born to run a business. They right. are doing because of certain way. And at the same time, when we people say that money is not everything, but money is it's close to everything in terms of 
getting the money worry aside. So if you don't have a, a worry about money, just think about each and every individual, what kind of life they have. There are a lot of people who have so many talents and they are buried along their grave uh, that they have not, I mean, at the time of their, in the deathbed, a lot of people regret that they have, they should have done something which they never done, did in, in their, mm -hmm. in, in the past. So these are some of the things that we have to do. And obviously I can go on and on. Uh, we are, uh, we are towards the end and uh, definitely in future, I would like to get some more specifics around that. Yeah. Uh, but we definitely got some nuggets. And as you're mentioning, you are 32, right? Yes. 32. Yes. So that uh, the people who are 32 years old or younger, definitely uh, there's a lot of inspiration for, uh, as you can see, Chris, he has such a, a, a wisdom and he started uh, thinking about these invested uh, investment in the early age. And this is something everyone has to either you sulk or lament or you start doing whatever the age you are. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who have done a lot of good things at the starting of the age 50. And by the age 60, they at least in a very comfortable uh, position based on yeah. where they would like to be. So yeah, uh, that is something which we can definitely do that. Uh, so towards the uh, tapering end of our uh, conversation, uh, Chris, in 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 our uh, in our daily life, obviously, uh, one of the things you mentioned about try to kind of save, try to invest, where you're getting returns and all. If nothing works out, what what are your advice on this? I mean, obviously, when people say, "Oh, in my life, you don't know what what I'm going through. You don't understand," uh -huh. and and you don't know what kind of financial situation I'm facing, and it's really easy for you because maybe they assume that you were born with a silver spoon. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your uh, quick summary on that? Uh, what, what they, what's your advice on this basically? So one of the things I actually talked to my counselor about mm -hmm. is because I'm, I'm an extremely competitive and motivated guy. And that's not like a braggy thing. That's just, that's who mm -hmm. I am. I'm always trying to better myself like obsessively, probably to a fault. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had a number of people and you can hear it, right? If you hear about, okay, well, you grew up in a financially literate family. You went to a private school. Okay. So like they just assume I was rounding third on a lot of things. And I could also argue that they're not wrong for, for many kids because I mean, I went to school with some kids that, I mean, we were well off, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, like it's impossible to screw this up. We went to school with some kids where, you know, their parents or grandparents sold their businesses for hundreds of millions of dollars. And unless, I mean, even if you were a certifiable moron, you're still going to be okay. You know, like, I don't care who you are. If you sell a business for 800 million, dude, you, you're going to be all right. Like it's, it's going to be fine. So there's always been that preconceived notion and actually totally switching gears on a finance side. And this might be an interesting way to end it. Mm -hmm. That is why I fell so madly in love with the world of fitness, because for me, I didn't have health growing up. I've had Crohn's disease since I was four. When I was younger, that's my, that was my, my ask for Santa was to become healthy and I didn't get it. And so year after year, after year, flare up after flare up, you know, being made fun of all that fun stuff. Cause kids are ruthless in middle school. Right. Mm -hmm. It got to a point in, and I think it was my sophomore year in high school where I said enough's enough. I'm going to die trying or I will become healthy. There's no middle ground. And I remember I started running on the treadmill and for a half hour, I was just dead and I puked my friggin' guts out. And I remember I looked myself in the mirror and I have this weird switch when I turn it on, like just, get out of my way. And I, I was, I was name dropping on myself, call myself a little bitch, all that fun stuff. And I said, you cannot be this unhealthy and this pathetic at 17. And then the next day I ran, you know, Ralphed a little bit, not as bad. And then by the, a week that went by, it's like, okay, now my body's starting to get revved and charged. And then you fast forward. I got into powerlifting. I started competing in drug-free bodybuilding. I can no longer do that because I was diagnosed with low T in 2020. So I'm on testosterone replacement therapy, but I still live that life. And one of my favorite moments in lifting was, uh, I was in college. Now I was a little huskier <laughs> than I am now because powerlifting, you don't care about aesthetics. You just calories in calories out. 
to move weight from A to B. It's like a Hummer. Yeah. You just rev the mm -hmm. engine, all the gas is gone. And so my greatest lifting accomplishment, and this is a big deal for me. I know people have lifted way more. I was able to deadlift 505. I remember that vividly. And, you know, when you're lifting that amount of weight, you've got to be crazy. Like I had some <laughs> dark thoughts going into my mind and halfway up and it was a slow lift. I, I can remember it like it was yesterday. You got all my buddies around, cheer me on, cheer me on. I get to the top and I remember just locking in and it was silent. Like the world just went silent and I was at peace. And it was one of those things where I looked at a lot of my friends and of course they're cheering me on. But when you do something like that, and I was two, I don't know, 205, 215. That was one of those moments where people go, oh shit. Because I don't care what excuse you have. In the world of finance, you could say, hey, you know, he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth or whatever the case is. Yeah. In fitness, there's no excuse. And that's why deadlift is my favorite exercise. It's the only exercise where you can't get a spotter. It's all yeah. you. And so for me, I was gifted enough to take that mental model and apply it to my business. So even if someone wanted to make that excuse, they can't because yeah. I know mentally I'm, I'm fortified enough for that. So <laughs> I guess what yeah. I would tell your listeners that if they had right a, a, a um, an amazing upbringing and all that, number one, don't feel guilty about it. It's not, it's not your fault that maybe your friends or spouse or, you know, business partners had a shittier upbringing than you. Don't apologize for that. You know, like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. My parents were better. <laughs> Don't feel bad about that. Yes. And then number two, find your deadlift equivalent. Mm. Because if you can find that and you've got something out there where you go, okay, you know what? Maybe I was, but let me tell you where you can't change that, Right. No one could say, it doesn't matter how much money you have, newsflash, dude, if you're deadlift in 505, you can't pay for that. That is earned. Yes, exactly. I think that's an excellent uh, perspective uh, to end that uh, you cannot judge. You mentioned about what kind of physical uh, challenges you face, but still you find your way. And, and uh, because me as a runner as well, I totally resonate that in order to have a healthy mind, you should be having a healthy body uh, to think and, and try to act whatever you are. So mm -hmm. that being said, uh, Chris, uh, it was definitely a, a great conversation. And I thoroughly enjoyed because uh, you not only provided some evidence, uh, some numbers to think and ponder about uh, for the audience, but also you provided some of the challenges you face as well. Uh, which shows that every human has certain challenges. It's just like what kind of lens we are looking at mm -hmm. uh, to look uh, that, oh, this guy's uh, or girl is a privilege versus uh, working towards your uh, your issues and then try to excel. So any last word for the listeners, uh, how they can reach out to you? I know I was out. If you haven't uh, kind of uh, given any information about your book, obviously you are an author as well. Uh, which is a great inspiration. Someday, if I write a book, I'll reach out to you as well. So please, uh, <laughs> yeah. let me yeah. know any parting thoughts. Yes, yes absolutely. Well, and I know I, I plugged myself when you were um, transitioning your daughter out of your studio. Yeah. So um, we'll start with the book. So if you want to learn about my framework, um, whether it's reading paperback, hardback, Kindle, or audio, audiobook, go to amazon.com, mm -hmm. type in Capitalize Your Finances, that is my book. Um, it's been out for about a year. We hit Amazon bestseller a couple weeks ago for a small snippet of time. That was pretty cool. So the book side of things, go to Amazon. If you just want a quality podcast where I teach you how to capitalize your finances, I bring in smart investors or celebrities where they've gone through their life from a financial lens, head on over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube, type in Capitalize Your Finances, and you see those videos every Monday. From a business side, if you want to check out our business, um, you know, and again, this is a, you know, we're, we're, we work with accredited investors only, minimum of half a million dollars, but you can type in capitalizeyourfinances.com and, and check out how I run my business. And then uh, another fun little plug from a course standpoint, I am coming out with my first masterclass December 1st. 
And so if you right. want to follow me on Instagram, mm -hmm. you can either type in Chris Paniotu or, or Cap and Capitalize, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Um, you can follow me, DM me anything, and you will be up to up to date with everything I've got going on. And uh, and for those of you that are listening in, if you for whatever reason wanted to be a guest on the show, we can't guarantee obviously a spot, but if you go to capitalizepodcast.com, shoot us a DM. My team and I look at it every single day. So that's how you can reach me. Oh, yes. oh yeah, definitely. I have seen some of the episodes and I really like the way how the quality of the podcast and, and the way how you present and bring the guest. And this is something which everyone has to take advantage of. Uh, and you have to get to uh, get to start something and and stop lamenting about uh, the situation what you have. So that being said, uh, Chris, again, thank you so much for spending uh, some quality conversation here. And I'm definitely looking forward for your more episodes, learning some financial advice uh, for through your podcast as well. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely look forward if I'm, I think you are in Seattle, if I'm not wrong. Seattle. Uh, yeah. Or we're in Tacoma, 45 minutes. So okay, yeah. got it. Yeah. So obviously, because I work for Microsoft, so uh, maybe once in a while I can go there. And if I, then definitely I'll give you a buzz and we can have a cup of coffee.